Today's show is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls and load balancers, a new managed Kubernetes service, and much more. From predictable pricing to flexible configurations to world-class customer support, you'll get access to all the infrastructure services you need to grow your business. Plus, DigitalOcean's community provides over 2,000 tutorials to help you stay up to date on the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. So to get started on DigitalOcean for free, with a free $50 credit, go to do.co slash cloudcast. That's do.co slash cloudcast. Cloudcast Media presents, from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is The Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Good to be back with everybody this week. Hope everybody's doing well. They're, you know, getting acclimated to the summer. Hopefully, uh, you know, if you've got families, the kids aren't driving you crazy and uh, you're getting a chance to uh, to enjoy some of the sunshine and the weather out there. So good to be back with everybody. Uh, I want to dive into some of our cloud news of the week for this week. Not necessarily a huge week in terms of news, but a couple of interesting stories out there to kind of keep things churning, keep the wheels churning, keep you interested in what's going on. Um, first one, you know, from a, uh, you know, kind of industry interaction perspective, um, IBM and AT&T announced a uh, multi-year strategic alliance. Essentially, um, AT&T is going to run a number of their communication services, um, back office services and all on IBM's cloud and with IBM. IBM is going to help them manage it. And uh, AT&T is going to become sort of the exclusive provider of SDN networking services uh, for IBM uh, as part of this partnership. And so opportunity at a very, very large scale for both companies to uh, to not only share technology, but but work closely in terms of you know how they take uh, their technologies to market as well as serve their internal needs. So a couple of very big companies getting together to do some partnerships. Um, you know, in the venture capital space, we always try and, uh, you know, track where's the money going, follow the money. Uh, big year so far in 2019 for venture capital. So right now, uh, venture capital is on track to kind of break some records for 2019, which surprises us a little bit. We had heard that uh, A and B rounds were getting tougher to find, but we're seeing uh, venture capital uh, raising a lot of mega rounds. So uh, some details in the show notes that we'll put in terms of what kind of money is being raised and, uh, and where it's going. And Kind of surprising, especially given the number of, uh, of big uh, IPOs that have happened this year. So Uber and, um, and Zoom and some others, very big IPOs happening. But uh, a lot of money still flowing into the market. So the market is still positive on what's going on in the technology markets. You know, we always try and uh, include some things that are kind of not so much specifically around technology, but kind of in that digital transformation space that we talk about, you know, how this is affecting companies that you wouldn't think of as software companies. Uh, but we did see John Deere acquiring a company called Golf Software Company called OnLink. So what they're essentially doing is uh, obviously John Deere, uh, lots of business uh, selling tractors and various agricultural types of capabilities uh, to the golf industry. Uh, you know, how do we take care of things? Trying to bring more software to that, trying to bring greater precision, bring more data to those environments. So interesting to see, you know, John Deere, who you would typically think of in the kind of physical goods, tractors and, and lawnmowers and all sorts of things, trying to bring uh, data and information to the people that are using those tools, hopefully helping them, uh, you know, use less fertilizer, less water, uh, better, you know, better uh, fuel efficiency and so forth. So again, kind of interesting to watch those types of transactions take place. And the last thing I've got on my list, and this is one of those, again, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about HPE announcing this term cloudless and uh, the Clouderati going, come on, don't do that. Well, uh, we, we are now beginning to jump the shark on uh, on terrible terms. Um, some folks over at buildazure.com, which is, I believe, a, uh, a consulting type of company around Azure, not Microsoft specifically, but they're starting to call multi-cloud polynimbus. So folks, let's not do that. We know we don't love multi-cloud or hybrid cloud or some of those terms. You may not love them, but we don't need to get crazy about this stuff. Just leave them alone. They are what they are. Serverless has servers. Uh, clouds have clouds. So with that, we're going to kind of wrap up Cloud News of the Week. Um, not a lot going on this week, but we just kind of wanted to give you a few things to chew on beyond the interview. Uh, and this week, we have a very interesting interview. So Steve Kearns, who is VP at Elastic, is going to talk to us. You know, we all know Elastic is a really uh, well-known, well-defined search company, but really want to kind of get into what other things beyond what we typically know, typing things in the toolbar, 
do we do with search? How has search become such a day-to-day -day component of so many applications? It's enabling a lot of a really new applications and so forth. So very, very excited to talk to the folks from Elastic. We're gonna get to that with our interview right now. Today's sponsor is Datadog, the real-time monitoring platform that unifies metrics, logs, and distributed request traces from your containers and orchestration software. Track the health and performance of your dynamic containers, apps, and services with rich visualizations and machine learning driven alerts. Datadog's cluster agent streamlines data collection from large container clusters and allows you to auto-scale Kubernetes workloads based on any metric you've already collected with Datadog. To start monitoring your Kubernetes clusters, sign up for a free trial today, and Datadog will send you a free t-shirt. Visit datadoghq.com slash cloudcast to get started. And we're back. You know, folks, one of the things that we're always trying to dig into more and more is there are a lot of really cool applications getting built these days, a lot of things that people interact with that they, they base their business on that are either kind of personally critical for them or business critical for them. And a lot of times we know the front end of applications, but we don't always understand what goes on behind them to make the applications easy to use, be really rich in data, give us great recommendations, all those things that are making amazing applications today. And obviously one of the things that enables so much of what goes on in applications today is is search and you know search data collection being able to visualize things so we thought we would dig into that a little bit more today uh, i know there's been a lot of demand for that from the audience so really want to dig into that today very very excited to have steve kearns who is vp of product at elastic joining us today steve welcome to the show happy to be here thanks for having me um so you are your VP of product at Elastic. You've been there for a little while. Uh, before we dive into Elastic and the things you're doing today, um, give the audience a little bit of your background, kind of what got you into this space and uh, you know what keeps you passionate about it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it, it's a long story. Um, no, it's it, it's great. I've, uh, I've worked pretty much my entire career in the information extraction and information retrieval, sort of the search and text analytics end of the world. Uh, and as you might imagine, that's a natural uh, uh, path towards search. Uh, when I one of my first jobs out of college, I worked. Uh, it was basically building a TiVo. So, you know, one year archive recorded video with speech to text, and we built a search engine on top of it. We had entity extraction and, and had a whole application to allow you to search across that one year of television um, word by word and, and watch it play back live. Um, and I got hooked. I got hooked on the power of search and, and the power of text analytics. Um, and so coming out of that, I, I went and worked at a, a company in, in Boston called, uh, Kim, uh, called Basis Technology. And this was a text analytics company, multilingual search. So search in you know, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, of course, English as well, a number of, of uh, Western languages. Um, and it really got me deep into the search side of the world. And you get to see a lot of interesting things be built. Um, some of these are sort of like enterprise search applications, but then you start to see it used to power, you know, the interfaces that people are using on websites and applications that people were using. And so even back then in, in the sort of mid 2000s, we started to see this uh, uh, use of search and beyond just sort of document or text search. And it became really interesting to me. And so over my years at Basis, we did quite a bit of text analytics and supporting these applications. And um, over the years, that led me towards, uh, uh, towards Elastic. Um, I got to know some of the founders of Elastic, the company. I was actually an early user of Elastic, the Elastic Search, the product. Um, and so when an opportunity arose at, at Elastic uh, about five years ago, um, I jumped on the opportunity to, uh, to join the company. Um, when I joined Elastic about five years ago, we were a relatively small company, about 100, uh, 100 or so people, a little, little less. Uh, and these days, we're more than 1,500 people. Um, so pretty rapid growth over that time. Um, and uh, it's been fun to, uh, to participate. I mean, what gets me up in the morning, why I've been excited and, and continue to be even more excited every day here is the number of people actually using this product to, uh, to, to actually solve problems in their real life. Um, we're not hoping that people will use it. We're, we're actually sort of doing our best uh, to keep up with all the different ways that people are already using us. Um, it's a wonderful place to be in from a product perspective as a product manager. Uh, we don't have to come up with the ideas. Uh, our users are doing that for us every day. They're, they're really pushing the bounds of what the technology can do. And that's a tremendous amount of fun. Very, very cool. Very cool. Yeah, you hit on, you hit on a number of things that I want to talk to you about today. Um, let's start with some basics around search. Uh, you know, obviously, from a consumer perspective, we all 
We all know Google. We use search for lots of different things in our life, whether it's shopping or, you know, planning a weekend vacation or whatever it might be. Um, for folks, you know, you know, who maybe don't necessarily understand a lot of where search is incorporated on the business side of things and enterprise applications and so forth, um, give us a sense of kind of how broadly search gets intertwined, intertangled into business applications. What are some of the things that maybe people know every day that they don't think of search or maybe some of the unique ones that you're running into? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it spans the the gamut. I mean, if, if you hailed a ride home in a, a, a ride sharing program like Uber or, or um, Lyft or one of the others, very likely that search that matched you with your location to a driver that is nearby was powered by Elastic. Um, if you use something like Yelp to find a nearby restaurant or Tinder maybe to find a date, uh, these kinds of applications are all fundamentally search uh, applications, right? They're, right? they're finding you something near you. Uh, some of the use cases are obvious, right? So, so you know, uh, a lot of e-commerce applications that you use, I think the second largest one on the web, Dell.com and, and you know, systems like Instacart uh, are also based on our products. And so those experiences, that interactive querying that you do is entirely based on, uh, on our software sort of behind the scenes. Um, but there's sort of fun, fun use cases as well. One of my favorites goes back a couple of years uh, with NASA JPL. Uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the, the Mars uh, Opportunity and, and Curiosity rovers uh, are sending back all of the telemetry data, how much battery is being used, which direction is it facing, you know, how much power is each of the motors using at any given point in time. It's sort of uh, uh, all of that gets streamed back and eventually lands in an elastic search cluster. Um, so sort of like uh, interplanetary uh, uh, Internet of Things uh, kind of use cases. Um, but the fun part is when you think about a lot of these different applications that you might imagine, whether it's Yelp or, or you know, Instacart or even just looking at um, you know, the, the way that information moves within your organization, um, how, how are machines communicating in your network? Your security teams probably want to know about that. Uh, and so we have uses across the, the board. And, and for us, all of these really boil down to different kinds of queries um, so whether you're looking at a chart, like a histogram that says, you know, which machines in my network are talking to which other machines, uh, or you're looking at a map to say, you know, where are the delivery trucks right now? Um, these are search uh, uh, use cases. This is just another kind of search, right? I zoom in on a map, it repaints the picture. That's a, that's a search that's being done to limit where I'm looking uh, just to, uh, to, to sort of what's in front of me or what's on the, the screen now. So these for us are all different kinds of search use cases. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, it definitely combines things that are, you know, very much real time that people, like you said, you know, an Uber or Lyft where you're, you know, I want to know where you are. I want to get to a hotel. Uh, you get into huge data sets, you get into things that, that are analytical. So yeah, it's got to be sort of a fascinating area in terms of, uh, you know, what people are trying to do and, and make sense of really large chunks of information and, and lots of information. Um, you know, we started off talking about search. Um, Elastic as a technology kind of tends to also get mentioned in in a lot of stack conversations. So it's it's part of the Elk stack or the EFK stack. It's you know it gets mentioned like with analytics or metrics or security. How do you how do you as a as a product manager manage that in terms of you know all these different potential use cases, all these different stacks where it could kind of get incorporated and in some things that that obviously you know Elastic as a company is is deeply involved with, but but then so many of these things that you may not have control about. Like how do you how do you think about all those permutations? It, it, it's very interesting. It, it's been a fun challenge over the years. And I think our, our approach has evolved as we have grown and as our users um, have grown and sort of demanded more. When I joined five years ago, we were very clear. We were building the Elastic stack. We were building Elasticsearch. How do we make sure that it can scale? How do we make sure it's good at geospatial data? How do we make sure it gets more efficient with handling numerics and range queries so that we could broaden what, the Elastic, what Elasticsearch itself was good at and what the stack itself could handle? Um, and we made explicit choices in those days to say we don't want to focus on any specific one use case. And so we prioritized and focused on the features that would help everybody. Um, and that meant that we didn't do as much for even some of our common users. Um, and so when, when you know, I think logging and metrics, the sort of operations, IT ops kind of use cases started to pop up and become more common, we started to get to a point where we said, gosh, you know, we feel bad that we're not doing more because we have so many users who need it and who would benefit from dedicated, customized UIs and features and ingestion components that would help here. Um, but we weren't at the time investing. 
And so, I don't know, 18 to closer to two years ago, we started to actually realize, okay, we've reached a size in terms of our engineering team and our ability to, uh, to, to, to sort of mature these products that we could actually stand up dedicated engineering teams on top of the stack that can go and build these tailored experiences, both from collecting data right up through the user interface. And, uh, and it really you know, was part of our long-term strategy all along. But when we reached that point, it was like unlocking a, 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 I don't know, a whole new set of features that we'd sort of been holding back from. Now, if you go and look at what happens when you go and download the Elastic Stack, Elastic Search, Kibana, work with um, our ingestion components like Beats and Logstash, um, you've got easy ways to pull in data from infrastructure, uh, you know, lots of pre-canned data sources for modules around you know, all of your log sources, your applications that are running, uh, as well as your security-related sources. So who's logging into your systems, who's opening network connections, what processes are opening those connections. Let's look at DNS traffic for command and control behavior. And so it's almost like we started building these solutions on top of the stack as another layer of very focused development uh, targeting these use cases. And so, you know, at the company level, we've now got dedicated engineering teams in all of these different areas. And so this evolution of saying, let's build the stack to be good at a lot of different things. And in the focus of the stack was to be constantly better. Um, now our focus on solutions or our new additional focus on solutions really opens up a lot of new doors uh, for making it easier for people to succeed with the use cases that we already saw people using uh, the stack for, sort of the hard way uh, in the early days. Yeah, interesting. It's uh, it, it's sort of the classic. You start off as being very horizontally focused. Over time, you, uh, you, you get better feedback from the market. You become sort of vertically integrated on things. Um, I, I'm curious as a, as a at the core, Elastic is, is an open source project. Um, there's a lot of people that contribute to it. There's a lot of people that make modifications. Um, do you do you have a sense at this point, having you know been in this space for for a while, um, how much do you, do your customers or your partners feel comfortable with sort of the the stacks that you put together versus them using them as as kind of references, and then they they have to make modifications because their their use cases are sort of unique. Is it is there a pretty good mix between them, or do do people really look to you now more to to build the integrated stacks, and they're comfortable with that? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think it depends on the kind of use case. So if you're building an application, if you're building a Yelp or, or Tinder or something, um, you can, you'd use Elasticsearch almost as the core of that. And everything you do gets built around uh, Elasticsearch directly. And so in that case, you're not maybe using some of our ingestion components like Beats or the UI of Kibana. Um, but but for, for certain other use cases where, where you do like logging or metrics or, or security analytics in SIM, I think we we have now started. Uh, we're, we're not done, and we hopefully will never be done. Um, but we've started to do a lot better at providing the whole solution for people, so that they don't have to go and create things. If I look even even today, people who are using us for security analytics or replacing their SIM, uh, there's a great use case um, uh, out of the Big Ten schools uh, called the OmniSoc. The the Big Ten schools got together and uh, and they realized that to protect all of the different schools, the network and so forth, uh, they had to have a security operations center. And they went and they built it around the Elastic Stack. They're collecting data with Beats, using Kibana as a big portion of the UI, but they had to build certain other components themselves. And what we're setting off to do now is to lower the number of things you have to go and build yourself and making it easier and easier to succeed. And so in a lot of ways, it's sort of like the, the early adopter model where we see a lot of people already using us for these use cases. And we look and we say, what can we do to make your life a little bit easier? How can we give you one more component that you don't have to build that we can build and maintain for you? And you can give us feedback. You can contribute to it directly and, and participate in that building. Um, it's, a, it's a much more interesting model uh, because we're building towards people that are already using us instead of like a, a traditional commercial company would try to come in and say, okay, I'm going to enter the security market. I need to go back, go back behind closed doors for two years, build a whole thing and surprise the world. Um, we can just say, hey, you know, hundreds of thousands of users already using us for, as, as a SIM or, or to augment an existing security uh, analytics program or threat hunting. We're now going to give you a better set of tools than you had yesterday. Uh, and then the day after that, we're going to give you an even better set of tools. And that's a wonderful place to be because um, you see these things used. You get that interactive feedback directly. Uh, and so I think over time in each of these solution areas that I mentioned, we're sort of lowering the barrier to entry um, dramatically for folks, which is which is really powerful. Yeah, no, it makes makes a ton of sense. I mean, obviously, over time, you've got 
years of experience of having done common things, which, uh, you know, are essentially are just building blocks. They're not necessarily going to be business differentiators for, for those companies, but they do, if they can just get them, consume them and start building on top of them, it makes, makes a ton of sense. Leverage, leverage the experience that you have, but also leverage the experience of a, of a very broad set of people that have, have dealt with it before. Um, Let's talk a little bit about some of the the, the things that people are building with it. Obviously, um, you know, search being one of those really powerful building blocks that developers have at their fingertips. Um, what are some of the things within the stack, whether it's search related or you know data and analytics related or security related, are are really starting to attract developers these days? Are sort of new new and interesting? Uh, you know, that they're starting to incorporate in their applications or using as powerful tools. Yeah, I think you know, there's a couple of different aspects. So one of the areas that the, that the Elasticsack has been used for quite a bit over the years has been what we're now starting to call observability. This idea of bringing application logs, system and service metrics, and APM data together in one place. Um, I think that this has been an area, again, we've been used widely. Um, and over the last couple of versions, we've really doubled down on what we're capable of. In fact, if you go back about 18 months, we, we joined forces, we, we acquired, uh, we call it joined forces, uh, with, uh, with a company called Opby out of Copenhagen, which was an APM company. And we took the, the wonderful product that they had built and we directly integrated that right into Kibana, made that from a SaaS service, we turned it as a set of free features as part of the stack. And, uh, and so now we've already been good at logging, we're already great at capturing infrastructure and service metrics. And so now we're starting to bring these three pieces together, uh, which is a huge improvement for, for developers to actually understand what is actually happening in their application. I mean, the, the promise of distributed tracing uh, is really hard to deliver on depending on what level of visibility you have to each of the layers in your stack. Um, it's nice to get that timing information, but don't you want a whole history of how the service has been performing? Um, and, uh, and so that's been a big area, I think, of investment for us, bringing those three areas of logging through infrastructure metrics and APM together. Um, and this has been particularly fun as we've integrated some of the other features. So another company that we joined forces with um, now, I think it's just over three years ago, um, was a company that built, we, we sort of marketed around machine learning, but really the, the core of the capability is anomaly detection on time series data. And so you start to say, well, we've got this wonderful anomaly detection capability, and now we're doing a great job at actually providing you a full picture of how your applications are performing. Um, it gives these, these application developers and, and the DevOps folks um, you know, the, a, a real unbelievable transparency into the overall uh, performance of their applications and really gets them to the why. Uh, why is something happening? Uh, if something is odd, how do we very quickly pinpoint where uh, the issue is and, and go and fix it? And so these are powerful uh, capabilities that, uh, you know, for, for the developers out there, I think are um, uh, just critical uh, to how built applications get built today and, and how they'll continue to be built in the future. If you can't see it, if you can't observe it, um, you know, you can't improve on it. And I think this is really one of the, the driving forces behind our, our efforts in these areas. Yeah, no, obviously makes a lot of sense, especially as we're seeing, um, you know, not only people dependent on these applications 24 by 7, but we're seeing more microservices applications, more architectures that are distributed. You've got to figure out what's going on in seven different places at the same time. <laughs> I, 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 th I think it's interesting you highlight all these things. We've been, uh, you know, those are topics that sort of individually we've been covering on the show, whether it's observability, you know, web scale logging, uh, time series databases, sort of as their own individual thing. It's interesting to see them come together and and it's also always sort of becomes interesting as to are those things that operations and platforms team should be focused on? Should that be their responsibility or should that be something that, you know, you've got to give some aspect of that to the developers so that they can, you know, do things on their own and, and not be dependent on, you know, waiting for operations to be ready. I, I'm curious, uh, do you find as as these things come together, they they sort of skew towards platform and ops? Do they skew towards the apps teams? Does it kind of depend on the use case? It does depend on the use case. I mean, I think we've been uh, in, in a lot of ways, riding the, I don't want to say the bleeding edge, but but we've been uh, really well adopted in the DevOps world. And so folks who are sort of combining the application development and the operational responsibilities, uh, those organizations tend to be a lot more nimble because they can directly respond and fix and address issues versus having a separate application team and a separate operations team. But having said that, you know, in a lot of organizations, the divide exists and it's real. And in some cases, it has very good reasons. Um, and so, you know, one of the nice things that I like about this is 
they, they work really well together when you can. But if they are a little bit more separate, you can uh, actually use these uh, uh, for these different use cases independently. They don't right. have to be tied together. Right. But the fact that you can, when you can, really makes a big difference. And it's funny, one, one of the things we've observed is in some of the organizations where uh, these were separate roles and responsibilities, the fact that you can get this visibility in a single system, a single pane of glass, uh, in a much more intuitive way, it actually starts to bring those teams closer together where your infrastructure team for the first time is saying, hey, application team, come take a look at this. Come come to our system and look. Uh, and uh, and it really what we found is reduces a lot of what, you know, it, in the olden days would have been finger pointing to say, this is a storage problem. No, it's a compute problem. No, it's an application problem. Uh, when you have that single pane of glass, you don't have to argue about it. Everybody can get on the same page for trying to help. Yeah, no, it, it's definitely helpful to have common metrics, common uh, sort of tools that you're looking at, especially, like you said, when you get into areas of troubleshooting and finger pointing and, and just trying to do correlation over time and so forth. So it makes a ton of sense to, to start to have commonality of those things. Um, let me shift gears a little bit. Uh, you know, one of the one of the biggest trends that we've seen with this show, and the show's been around for a while. So, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, people be very comfortable with on-prem. It was what they had done for a long time. Uh, we saw open source has been evolving and become the center of innovation. So people are become more comfortable with that. And then obviously as, as the public cloud, as a concept has become more and more mainstream, people are become comfortable with that. Um, Elastic has kind of plays in all those worlds, right? You, you know, yeah. you, you have an open source offering, you've got commercial software that people run, you have public cloud services. How do you, how do you explain those things to people in terms of, you know, what's common in the experience? You know, when should they make a choice of, you know, leveraging, you know, a, a service that some something is run for them on behalf of that? Like, how do you find people kind of adapt to, you know, what's sort of changed in terms of where software comes from, how they pay for it, when they should invest in skills to run it versus letting somebody else run it? How do you find that conversation shakes out? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, in some senses, we just want to be there for our users wherever it is they want to run. Um, and so, you know, we have a you know fully fully managed Elastic Cloud, which you know runs and manages the Elastic Stack, and it's really a great service. Um, but for our users, well, we also have self managed, and, and we have different uh, areas in between. And so, we sort of start by asking, you know, are you running in a public cloud today? If you are, do you like managed services? If you do, we have one. Um, but I do think that, that there's a lot of additional advantages that come from a managed service. Things like you know, the ability to have one button click to upgrade a whole cluster, whether it's a one node cluster or a hundred node cluster. Um, just that, that simplicity from an operations perspective means I don't need to think about where is this running? What infrastructure is it on? Do I need to patch the underlying hardware? All of that gets totally managed for you. And then it's just a matter of saying, how much do I want to consume? And you get slider bars to pick. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of um, operational ease that comes from uh, fr from our cloud, um, our hosted cloud. And what we've realized is there's some users who love that aspect of it, like these one button click upgrades, total visibility into uh, uh, the ability to run and manage not just one giant cluster, but lots of smaller clusters to, to give people the right amount of isolation and the right amount of resource for their use case. Um, and so we've actually seen a number of our customers who wanted that that hosted like feeling, but on their own data center, since they're not ready or comfortable having, you know, either running at all in a public cloud, you see this in the government and in some places, as well as uh, financial services, they just don't want certain data to leave their physical data center. Um, but then you see other people who say, look, I, I'm on a public cloud, but I don't want other people to touch my machines. I need to have them in my own VPC, and, uh, and, and my internal security policies are defined in such a way that I can't use a managed service, but I still want that drag and drop scalability, one button click upgrades. And so we took the same software that powers Elastic Cloud and we made that available in something we call Elastic Cloud Enterprise as something that you can go and download and run on your premise and your own VPC and, and so forth that gives you that sort of middle ground. So it's like we're, we're trying to solve all of the problems uh, for at least trying to help people solve their problems in whatever way, whatever operating environment is appropriate for them. And if you want to download it and run it on your laptop, of course, you'll always be able to do that. That's one of the great powers uh, of uh, of the Elastic Stack. But, uh, but if you want more, if you want to drive a center of excellence where you're going to be managing one, 10, 50, hundreds, hundreds and thousands potentially of clusters, uh, for something like that, 
this uh, Elastic Cloud Enterprise can really be powerful if you're not able to use the public cloud. Yeah. Let me ask you one last question before we before we wrap up. And I, I found this from from a number of companies that you know are similar to Elastic. I, I, I'm at Red Hat. We're going through similar things. Um, do you find that as you have to run your own software as a cloud provider, essentially, you know, managed managed offerings, you run it yourself. Do you find that you learn things from operating it yourself that that then get into the product that maybe you wouldn't have necessarily done if you were just delivering software? You know, the 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 art of running it yourself, you learn a lot and and you want to embed that back into the product. Do you find that those learnings are are beginning to evolve? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is one of the greatest parts about running the service ourselves. I think it's always one that we want to do better at is is to learn more uh, around how how to make the products easier to run, easier to use. Um, But having our own cloud provider where we're running thousands and thousands of clusters, there's no better uh, better way to see how this stuff works at scale and and, and what it's what the experience is like to manage it and to write software that manages it uh, than running a, a cloud service. And so you learn a tremendous amount. And I think if, it, it, you know, I, I don't have any off the top of my head, but there's a, quite a few features and quite a few improvements that we've made uh, to Elasticsearch and to Kibana and other parts of the stack, whether it's from a security perspective, a, a scalability perspective or, or others um, that, uh, that make a huge difference. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the fun, fun ones was uh, Elasticsearch. We've always thought about how do we make it scale bigger? How do I support a bigger cluster, you know, petabytes and petabytes of data in a single cluster? Um, but with cloud, we also wanted to give people the ability to scale down and to say, I just need a little Elasticsearch cluster for now. Maybe later I'll need more. And so that's one of the examples where we actually pushed uh, ourselves to say, how small can an Elasticsearch cluster be and still be quite useful? And so, uh, so, so that's really nudged us in some interesting directions that, again, does more to expand what the stack is good at. And I think that's one of the things that's, that's helped uh, Elasticsearch and the stack as a whole be relevant for so long and, and continue to innovate is that we're never really giving up on improving the core. Uh, we're always going back to that. And, and that's really what all the rest of our solutions and, and use cases get built on top of. Yeah, no, it, it makes a ton of sense. And it, it's, it very much aligns to the things that, that I see out there is, is not only do people want you know, pricing how they want it, whether it's on demand or, or some longer term contract, but they, they want to know that, that you've run the software before they have to go run the software themselves and that uh, you've got that experience above and beyond the features. So very, very cool that you guys are seeing that. Um, I'm going to wrap it up with that. Um, what's the best way for folks? Obviously, you know, Elastic.co is the best place to go get information. But if folks want to reach out to you or maybe what are some of the, the events where, uh, you know, your team will be out and about that people can, can engage with, with yourself or with your team? Yeah, I mean, you can find us at a lot of the, the DevOps conferences. We also run our own uh, set of uh, a one-day conferences, uh, cities around the world. I think we've got 34 cities that we're doing this year. We call it the Elasticon Tour, Elastic On Tour. Uh, and it's wonderful. It, it's a great event. We bring our developers in region to, to these events. So if you're in France, we'll come and speak to you in French. Uh, and, uh, and it's a wonderful way to uh, hear what we're up to. And, uh, and talk directly to the engineers at the company to say, hey, I've got a question. Uh, and uh, at all of these conferences, we have an Ask Me Anything booth, which I think is, is the most fun both for us. I, I sort of will, will work in the booth and, and ask questions and answer questions. Uh, uh, you know, and it's also a, a big hit with, uh, with the attendees. So if you get a chance to attend one of those, I'd encourage you to. Uh, it's a great way to learn about the, uh, the products and where we're heading. Very, very cool. We will, uh, we'll get that information in the show notes for everybody who's listening. Steve, I want to thank you so much for your time. It's been uh, it's been great to kind of dig into it. Like I said, it's it's always interesting to understand how uh, the things that are behind the scenes powering you know the applications we live with every day and, and make them simpler are, are working. So thank you so much for the time today, folks. Uh, with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna thank Steve for his time. I want to thank everybody for listening. As always, thanks for telling a friend and thanks for rating the show on on iTunes and and wherever you get your podcast from. So with that, we're gonna wrap it up. We will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to the Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 